Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? I can hear nobody. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. Can we stand all over the building to just give God a hand of praise? Hallelujah. I say, can we stand and give God a hand of praise? Praise. Standing is an act of praise as well as clapping our hands. So can we clap our hands unto the Lord? Hallelujah. Can we give him reverence this morning for being such a wonderful God? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can you open your mouth and just tell him something wonderful this morning? Hallelujah. Can he hear you this morning? Hallelujah. Can we wake up and give God glory this morning for being such a wonderful God? Hallelujah. For waking us up, starting us on our way, activity of our limbs. Hallelujah. He's a great God and greatly to be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. If we can bow your heads in prayer. Father, we honor you. We bless your name. Yes. Father, we welcome you into this building, into these tabernacles, God. God, we pray right now, God, that you would just blow a fresh wind upon us this morning, Lord. Lord, we thanking you for just being thank Abba you. Father. Thank you, we Lord. thank you for being the Alpha and the Omega. We thank you, Lord, for being our healer this morning. Hallelujah. Your word said that you come and you heal every disease. Every and disease. so, Father, we thank you right now, God, that you're the healer. You're the way maker hallelujah you're the provider and we thank you lord for providing for us this morning and father we welcome you into this place we welcome you into this building god god we want you to have your way this morning hallelujah hallelujah if anybody came in here bound this morning god we pray that the chains be loosed in the name of jesus hallelujah thank you jesus god and god we promise to praise you this morning we're going to give you the glory no matter who's here and who's not you still get the glory hallelujah and so we honor your name this morning your name that is above every name the name of Jesus to where demons have to flee in the name of Jesus so father we honor you we bless your name in Jesus name we pray amen look at somebody and tell them I'm glad to see you this morning hallelujah hallelujah prophesy to somebody else and tell them that this week is going to be a good week for you hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah look at somebody else and tell them this week is going to be a good week for you hallelujah thank you Jesus glory be to God because I cannot explain it this may not make sense I know what it looks like but I choose to go against that and I'm speaking something different I'm claiming something different expecting something different expecting something different say I cannot explain this may not make sense I know what it looks like you may be going through hallelujah but I choose hallelujah and I'm claiming and I'm a claim it yeah come on let's go hey say this week will be a week for miracles this week will be a week for miracles say this week will be a week for miracles miracles Miracle. Let's say it again. Say this week, this week will, be will be a week for, week for miracles. miracles. This week, this week will, be will be a week for, week for miracles. miracles. This week, this week will, be will be a week for, week for miracles. 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 I don't have to wait. I don't have to wait till I see it. So I'ma praise Him now. Hey, I don't have to wait. I don't have to wait till I see it. And I'ma praise him now. I'ma praise him now, cause I believe it. Come on and help me say it again. Hey, say this week, this week will be, will be a week for, week for miracles. miracles. This week, this week will be, will be a week for, week for miracles. miracles. This week, this week will be. A week for, a week for miracles, miracles, miracles. I don't have to wait. I don't have to wait till I see it. Come on and praise Him now if you believe it. I'ma praise Him now because I believe it. Hallelujah! I don't have to wait. I don't have to wait till I see it. So I'ma praise Him I'ma now. Praise Him now because I believe it. Come 
Come on and help me say your miracle is on the way. Your miracle is on the way. Your miracle. Your miracle is on the way. Your miracle. Your miracle is on the way. Hallelujah. Your miracle is on the way. Get ready. Anybody ready for your miracle this week? It can happen today. Hallelujah. Your miracle is on the way. Your miracle. Your miracle. is here this morning. Whatever you've been praying about. Your miracle. Your breakthrough. Whatever you need. It's on the way. Listen, I don't have to wait. I don't have to wait till I see it. Hey, and I'm going to praise him now. If you got to praise, go ahead and praise him. Hallelujah. I don't have to wait. I don't have to wait till I see it. Cause I'ma praise him I'ma now. Praise him now, cause I believe it. Hey, your miracle is on. Your miracle is on the way. Anybody believe your that this morning? Is on the way. That your miracle. Your miracle is on the way. It's on the way. Your miracle is on the way. Get ready. Your miracle is on the way. Get ready. Your miracle is on the way. Get ready. I'ma receive my miracle this morning. Hallelujah. Your miracle is on. Your miracle is on the way. Your miracle. Walk in the miracle. Walk in the blessing. He has blessings ready for you. You just gotta walk in it. Your miracle. Now give God a shout of praise in here this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Give God a praise if you know that your miracle is on the way. You may not be able to see it right now, but it's manifesting in the heavens. Hallelujah. Those prayers that you pray, they're fighting for you. Your miracle, your miracle is on the way. It's on the way this morning. Hallelujah. Your miracle. Hallelujah. God has a miracle for you and you and you because I don't have to wait I don't have to wait till I see it see that's where the blessing come right there don't wait on it go ahead and praise him hallelujah I don't have to wait I don't have to wait till I see it and I'm gonna praise him now hey your miracle is your miracle is on the way your miracle This morning, I receive it. Your miracle. Hallelujah. Anybody ready for their miracle this morning? I don't know why I can't leave that alone. Somebody in here need a miracle to happen. You can't comprehend it with your mind. You just know that you need it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Woo. Hallelujah. Go ahead and praise him right now. Don't wait till the battle is over. You can go ahead and shout now. You don't have to wait for the miracle. Praise until the miracle come. Hallelujah. There's nobody like our God. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah, Jesus. My, my, my God.
serve a God like this, a God that's a healer, a God that's a provider and a sustainer. Hallelujah. Would you do me a favor and just lift your hands in the building and just tell God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. The next song that we're going to sing is called Healer. And I don't know what you need God to do in your life. Hallelujah. But if you need a healing in some area, I don't know what your area is. Just lift your hands and just give God a praise right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know what your testimony is, and I don't know what you need God to do. Hallelujah. But right here in this moment, can you just thank him in advance for the healing? Go ahead and thank him in advance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for healing. It could be that disease. It could be an infirmity. It could be your finances. Hallelujah. I don't know what your healing needs to be, but if you go ahead and put a praise on top of it, Hallelujah. God will be faithful to his word. And his word said that he will be your healer and that he will be your provider and he will be your sustainer. Hallelujah. So this morning we're calling on Jehovah, the healer this morning. Hallelujah. To come and touch us this morning. Sister Brittany is going to come and sing this song for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you pray with us as we sing it. And don't only sing with us, but worship with us. Amen. Because he's all you need. Hallelujah, we got you. I believe you're my healer. I believe you are all I need. I believe you're my portion. I believe. You're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. You're my Somebody say, I believe. I believe. You are all I need. But we do believe. I believe. I believe. You're my 
Hallelujah. Anybody need Jesus this morning? I said, anybody need Jesus this morning? Hallelujah. Anybody need Jesus this morning? Go ahead and lift your hands. Hallelujah. And tell him thank you. Hallelujah. Tell him thank you this morning. Thank you for being a healer. Thank you for being a provider. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 There it is. All right. Good morning, first nurse. The first. I can't even talk right. First Northeast. Amen. Pastor Splon isn't here. Um, I'm Minister Howard Newsom. Um, I'm welcoming you to our church today. We have a special surprise for you. The reason he's not here, if you haven't heard, baby Lucas has been born. So if you've seen it on, uh, on Facebook or whatever, big boy, seven pounds, seven ounces, 20 inches. I told pastor he's producing giants, um, him and his wife. That's okay. He might be part of the Nephilim, but that's an inside joke. So we're praying for her recovery and for him to spend time with his family. And we just, you know, thank God for all that they're doing and for their recovery. Um, quick announcements. Remember, back to school bash is this Friday. The block party is this Friday. So please come and uh, let us support our youth uh, and those who are going back to school. And also Children's Church starts next Sunday. So those of you who have children, uh, that will be open for us. We're starting next Sunday, so you can bring your children there. Um, I'm here to announce our speaker, uh, Minister John, Jeremy Kingsley. Uh, my family and his family actually went out to lunch the other day. We had a great time meeting each other, getting to know each other with Don, and his, his two sons, his athletic sons. Um, and, and after we had a wonderful time of fellowship, of, of hanging out, getting to know, we realized he's kind of a big deal. Like, for real, for real. So we looked him up, went on YouTube. Past 25 years, he's traveled around the world, speaking to over half a million people, speaking on, on Jesus and leadership. He, he's been the author of five books, uh, endorsements from Fortune 500 companies and many respected Christian leaders. Uh, he's been featured in national media shows, CBS, CNBC, Fox, Forbes, Wall Street, and, and many more. He's, he's really a big deal. And so he's so humble. And that's the thing. Come up, Pastor. And so w when you get to know him, you, you realize like, okay, how could this guy be so anointed as he is? And, and so we're just pleased and blessed beyond measure to have him come and, and speak to us today. So I'm going to pray for him real quick, and then I'm, I'm going to let him bless your hearts with the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for my brother, for allowing him to use his gift with us today. So we pray for your spirit to come and just be with us today. Uh, speak to us in a supernatural way. Prepare our hearts and our minds to see and hear your truth. Lord, we need to hear from you today. So have your way as only you can. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us welcome our brother, John Jeremy Kingsley. If you're watching but you know because you now have more than one boy because now he has two boys right I don't know if you know that you have a special membership uh, now that lasts for 18 years very special membership it's called the we're out of membership see when you have multiple boys and I know this for the next 18 years every time you go to the refrigerator every time you go to the pantry you're gonna say we're out of milk we're out of bread, we're out of chips, we're out of eggs, because when you got boys, they can eat. So welcome to the club of the membership, we're out of club. But we are excited about, woo, we're excited about baby Lucas, that's for sure. Well, uh, my family, just so you know, I met Stephen at a peacemakers conference, a racial reconciliation conference, and we connected, and I brought my family, and I said, let's go over and say hi to Pastor Stephen since we met at this conference. That was like four months ago, and we've been coming here ever since. I didn't know that was going to happen, but God's kind of led us here for, 
for now. And we appreciate how loving and welcoming everyone has been. Well, my wife's name is Dawn. On July 30th, we just celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary. Yeah, thank you. In case you're wondering, we got married in second grade. Um, and we have two boys, Jaden. He is getting ready to start his junior year at Charleston Southern, and he's going back to school next week. And then my other son, Dylan, he's about to start high school. They love Jesus, and we're proud of them. But I like saying about my wife, you know, we've been married 27 years, but we've been best friends 34 years. I like saying that better, because anyone can go down to the courthouse and get a piece of paper that says marriage license on it, but there's no piece of paper down there that says best friend on it, right? So she's my best friend. Well, the title of this message is Love Reaches Out. Love Reaches Out. Now, we're going to look at three little verses kind of tucked away in Matthew chapter 8. But before we do that, it would be good for us to understand a couple things. I want you to learn about the author. I want you to know a few things about the audience and kind of what happened before uh, Matthew chapter 8. So the author is Matthew. Now, he is a Jewish man, and he is a tax collector, right? Now, no one usually likes the IRS, and no one liked him. You know, he was hated and despised because it was like he's working for the other team. He goes and collects taxes from his countrymen, the Jews, then he turns right around and gives it to the Romans so people don't like him. But his life was changed when he met Jesus. And he actually became one of the 12 disciples. Now, he's writing to the Jewish people about this promised king. He's trying to explain to them that this Messiah that was prophesied about in the Old Testament has come, and his name is Jesus. But it's important to remember, the Jews were waiting for a king that had been promised centuries before. They believed that this leader, this Messiah, would be an earthly king and rescue them from the Roman oppressors. But there was a problem. They were really concentrating too much on the external situation, the external situation, the oppression of the Romans. They weren't wanting to deal with the internal situation, the oppression of sin in their lives. See, they liked the prophecies in the Old Testament about a ruling, powerful leader, but they overlooked some of the other prophecies that said this Messiah was going to be a suffering servant and that he was going to be rejected and killed. They didn't like those. I mean, sadly, many of them didn't recognize Jesus as Messiah. How could this blue-collar carpenter's son from Nazareth be the king? They wanted someone to come and rule and reign over all the people of the earth. But Jesus wanted to rule and reign in their hearts. So Matthew sets out to convince this Jewish audience, the readers, of who Jesus is. So let's just take, uh, take our time and start at the beginning before we get to Matthew chapter 8. Because in chapter 1, he starts with this uh, genealogy, which most of us usually skip over because it's just a bunch of names and names and more names. I'm not paying $99 to have a DNA match on Ancestor.com. I don't care that much. <laughs> but the Jewish family tree is a big deal. It proved a person standing, showing that Jesus was a descendant of Abraham and David. That was important. It showed some of the prophecies were fulfilled in the Old Testament about the Messiah's line. And don't forget this. In the first 17 verses of chapter 1, when they list those 46 people whose lifetime span over 2,000 years, uh, those ancestors of Jesus were all different people. They were different from heroes to villains, from godly people to ungodly people, rich and poor, people of different races, and a bunch of ordinary people that we don't know much about. But God's work in history isn't limited to humans. He uses all kinds of people to bring his son into the world, and he still uses all kinds of people to accomplish his will. So then Matthew 
goes into the miraculous virgin birth. Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit. We celebrate that at Christmas every year. But then there's this break. There's not really any information from his birth, right, up to where he's about 12. No information there. He shows up at 12 in Luke chapter 2, and he is talking with rabbis and religious leaders, right, in Jerusalem during the Passover festival. And Jesus is listening, he's asking questions, and these great teachers are amazed at his understanding and some of the answers that he has when they ask him questions. Remember how his mom was kind of nervous because she didn't know where he was? Remember what he said? Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Even at 12, he's on mission. But then there's another break. From 13 to 30, we don't really know much about him. The Bible doesn't say much. We just know he's growing in wisdom and stature. He learns a trade of carpentry, right, from his earthly father, Joseph. Now, if Jesus wanted us to know about his early childhood, if he wanted us to know about his adulthood, He would have told us. He would have let us know. Silence in Scripture is just as inspired as what is revealed. If he wanted us to know, he would have told us. So don't be getting all crazy about that. Well, then John the Baptist shows up on the scene with this message. Repent of your sin, for the kingdom of God is near. He actually baptizes Jesus, and Jesus starts his earthly ministry. So then the devil says, well, if you're going to start this ministry, I'm going to show up. And I'm going to tempt you. Remember the devil tempts Jesus? He misuses Scripture, but then Jesus properly uses Scripture and puts the devil in his place. Well, then Jesus calls his first disciples, starts teaching and doing some miracles. And it says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, Word was spreading fast about him beyond the borders of Galilee and even into Syria. So that leads us up to Matthew chapter 8. Now, I know you didn't know you were going to a Bible class about Matthew because you didn't know it was two for one Sunday. Buy one, get one free with your MVP card. But it was two for one today. So it says this in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Now, I know I'm not as cool as some of those younger speakers. I don't have the Bible on iPhone and iPad. So for some of you that don't understand, this is called a book. This is paper, this is leather. So I use one of these old school things called a book. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. By the way, there's a rule when we read the Bible. We don't read the Bible to finish, that's your word. We do read the Bible to change, that's your word. Let's review. We don't just read it to finish, we read it to change. We don't just read it to finish, we read it to change, that's right. Large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. Suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him and said, I am willing, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Now this story is actually in the Bible three times. It's also in Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 5. Everything in the Bible is important, but if the same story is in there three times, you might want to pay attention. Now I think it's good for us, for accountability purposes, to look at three questions when it comes to reaching out with love. Three accountability questions when it comes to reaching out with love. Am I approachable or unapproachable? just as a person am I inclusive or exclusive am I gracious or judgmental now do me a favor real quick everybody here everyone just raise your hand real quick everybody raise your hand how many of you have ever felt left out yeah me too me too that's right (laughs) yeah good I'm glad we can relate there I appreciate your honesty There are times in life where we feel left out. It can happen as a little kid in like kindergarten when you don't get picked to play uh, kickball or some game on the playground. It can happen in middle school when you don't get invited to the party. It can happen in your 20s when you ask that girl out and she turns you down flat. You know that hurts, boys. It can happen when you're an adult and maybe your kids don't talk to you anymore. Or maybe your parents don't talk to you anymore. 
But in our text, this person is left out for a different reason. The Bible said the large crowds were following Jesus because of the miracles and the teaching, but then all of a sudden this man with leprosy shows up. See, in Bible times, the people with leprosy, they're discarded. They're left out. They're ostracized, right? They're like the ultimate outcast. Luke chapter 5 says he had a severe case of leprosy. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a severe case of leprosy? Because there are symptoms, right? Well, here are some of the things you might see if you saw someone with a severe case of leprosy. Number one, all the hair on their body, on their arms, legs, on their head, turns pitch white. Now, that doesn't mean some of you older people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I've got a few myself. I understand. Your hair turns pitch white, right? You get sores all over your body. It affects your larynx or your voice box, right? They couldn't talk like Pastor Stephen does with that smooth voice or Minister Derek when he sings with that smooth and the worship team, they have that smooth voice. They don't have that because it destroys their larynx and their voice box. It makes their voice rough and gruff sounding. They struggle because it has a rough, gruff sound to it. It affects their central nervous system, which takes away their ability to feel. See, sometimes when you saw someone in Bible times with a severe case of leprosy, they might be missing fingers or toes or lips. They had a lot of problems, some of it from leprosy, some of it from other things. Because when you lose the ability to feel, someone with leprosy could be walking, step on something, cut the bottom of their foot open, but they didn't feel it. So they don't know they're cut. There could be an infection starting that they don't know is happening because they can't feel it. So now they're dealing with the leprosy along with other sicknesses that may have come up because they couldn't feel what was happening. Now, this disease was incurable by man. Only God could help. But there were rules for people with leprosy in society, right? The person with leprosy, they had to yell a word, unclean. So they had to walk around yelling, unclean, unclean. Now what does that mean? That means they are not allowed to participate in any social or religious activities. They can't come to the birthday party. They can't come to the cookout. They for sure can't come to church. You're not allowed in any social or religious activities. They had to cover their whole body and stand outside of villages and cities because they weren't allowed to go in. They either had to be by themselves or live in a leper colony, begging for food or clothes for what they could get. Now, there was a rule in society called the six-foot rule. Now, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because we've just been dealing with that with COVID. But it goes all the way back to the Bible times. It can be positive for the safety of health, but it also can be negative if you do that to someone for the wrong reason. You ever six-footed somebody when it wasn't because of the pandemic? You know what I'm talking about? When you go to work and you're going to the break room and there's someone in there that you don't like, and as you look in there, you say, you know what, I'm not going in there because they're in there. I'm going to keep some distance between us. I don't like that person. I'll take my break later. Sometimes I've seen people do it at church. Some people walk into the church building, and there's someone that's kind of made someone upset, and they wait. You're sitting over there. Well, then I'm sitting over here because the last time we interacted, I didn't like the way you treated me. So if you sit on that side, I'm sitting on this side. And they six-foot people. Not necessarily a good idea right there. Have you ever initiated separation with someone? Maybe because of an attitude problem? Pride? Jealousy? Fear? Unforgiveness? See, in the Bible, there were these guys called the Pharisees. They're the religious leaders, right? They're supposed to be leading people toward God, but they really lead people away from God. Very arrogant, very prideful, and they had a different rule. They didn't think the six-foot rule was enough, so their rule was 50 yards downwind. Now think about that. 50 yards downwind. Pharisees were so arrogant... They said, we don't want anything to do with you at all. See, we're holy and you're unholy. We're righteous, you're unrighteous. I don't sin, you obviously do sin because God's punishing you for your sin with this disease. Now let's take a time out real quick, time out on that. They had this big paintbrush to paint this broad idea that if you're sick, for sure God's punishing you. 
Now, you can't say that like that. You can't do that. That's a flag blocked below the waist, lost it down. You can't do that. Now, could it be true that there are some sins that may have a result of a physical ailment? Sure. If you're an alcoholic and you drink all the time and you destroy your liver or your brain, that's called reap what you sow. If you have an issue with other drugs and it affects you physically, it's called reap what you sow. Right? If you go around and sleep with a bunch of different people and you catch a sexually transmitted disease, that's called reap what you sow. So there are some sins that do have a physical consequence, but not all. I mean, I went to Columbia International University, and we have missionaries in like 140 countries around the world. I'm one of the idiots that stayed here, but don't judge me. I stayed here to do some mission work, right? But I have friends that have gone to other countries, and sometimes they get sick. Because they eat some food that has bacteria in it. Sometimes they get stung by some kind of insect and they get sick. God's not punishing them for a sin. They're sharing Jesus with people. So you can't paint some broad brush and say every time someone gets sick it's because of sin. That's what the Pharisees did. You got to be careful doing stuff like that. But they basically said, because of the 50 yards downwind, we don't want to see you with our eyes. We don't want to hear you we don't even want to hear the word unclean. And 50 yards downwind, we don't want to smell you. Because sometimes as their body breaks down, it will let off a certain stench. So they said 50 yards downwind. They initiated separation. They made someone feel left out. Now, it's one thing to feel left out. It's another thing to make someone feel left out. I know I've done that in the past. So I'm going to do something. I'm not sure I should do this. But I'm going to share with you a sin. Okay? I'm going to tell you a mistake that I made a long time ago when I was in high school. I was a senior in high school in 1989. Any of you remember the 80s, right? We had some funny clothes and some funny haircuts. So in the 80s, in 1989, I'm a senior in high school, and I am in the class called psychology, and we got this new teacher. Bless her heart, but she really wasn't that good. And she gave us this exam that had 100 questions on it. And it was so hard that like every single person failed it. You remember ever taking exams like that where like everyone fails it? But then there's always the one person who doesn't fail. Why is there always that one person? <laughs> Messes up the curve. <laughs> so I'm not having a very good day. And this girl behind me, her name's Beverly, she got like a 98. Now the rest of the class pretty much got 60s. I might have gotten the 40s, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> well, we start going over the exam. And all of a sudden, Beverly, who's sitting behind me, raises her hand. She goes, yeah, Miss Wharton, I noticed that you marked number 22 wrong on my paper. But if you look in the textbook, right, in chapter 4, section 2, line 17, it says in the experiment of Pavlov, and I'm like, what is she doing? What is she doing? Is she trying to get an extra point? She got a 98. She doesn't need extra points. I need extra points. Can't believe that. A couple minutes later, she raised her hand again. I mean, this is one of these people that a 98 means the world's going to end. Right? That's a bad grade for her kind of thing. So she tries to get credit again. Well, Miss Wharton, I think I should also get credit for this. Now, I'm getting upset at this time, so I just decided I'm going to put a stop to this. Now, I grew up in a pretty strict family. My dad was a pastor, military, high school principal, and basketball coach. Let's review. Pastor, principal, military, coach. Do you know what I'm saying? We had this phrase in my family, don't cross the line on certain things with people. Well, I'm about to cross the line. See, I went to high school in Washington, D.C. Beverly's making me mad. So I'm going to go over to Virginia for a couple minutes. I'm going to cross the line. So I turn around, true story, please don't do this because this was a sin. I turn around and said, Beverly, shut up! That is over the line. But I'm not done yet. I'm not anywhere near done. I'm about to go to Mexico. I turned around and I said, Beverly, shut up! What are you doing trying to get extra points when you got a 98 and everyone else failed? That's why no one likes you and that's why you don't have any friends. Oh. 
¿Cómo está? <laughs> All of a sudden, the teacher yells at me, Mr. Kingsley, you go to the principal's office right now, mister. I said, I know where it is. <laughs> a couple friends gave me five. Now watch this. A few years later, after Dawn and I got married, this email pops up. Hey, Jeremy and Dawn, this is Beverly from high school. Do you remember me? And I'm thinking, oh, dear. And then I get the tap from Jesus. You ever get the Jesus tap? Remember what you did? You sinned against her. You embarrassed her. You made her feel left out. Did you ever ask for forgiveness for that? See, I'm a Bible guy. I majored in Bible. My degrees are in Bible. Sometimes I think I can trick God with the Bible. <laughs> you ever try to trick God? Hey, you know what? I know in the Bible it says we should ask you for forgiveness. Now I'm going to skip over that other one that says if you sin against someone else, you need to apologize. We'll skip over that one. I'm going to skip the relational forgiveness and just try to go straight to you. When Jesus goes, hey, all sin's against me, so you've got to talk to me every time. But if you sin against another person, you need to go ask that person for forgiveness as well. So don't try to come with this sneaky backdoor move for cheap grace. Because I don't do that. Now, when I was 17, I didn't care that much about hurting people. But as I started to love Jesus more, Then it started to matter. So I hit reply. I said, Dear Beverly, I don't know if you remember this, but a long time ago when we were in high school, I yelled at you. I embarrassed you. I said some horribly rude things. I would like to ask if you would please forgive me. See, you never, ever make someone feel left out. When you're a Christian, we're trying to build the kingdom and bring people to him, not push people away. I'm not crying, I just got some allergies. So this leper comes up, and Jesus is the definition of approachable, right? I mean, no person is too rich, too poor. No person is too unclean or polluted or dirty or too sinful to come to Jesus. Because this guy's approachable. When people tried to ignore this man, Jesus noticed him and acknowledged him. When people tried to push him away, Jesus allowed him to come close. When people rejected him, Jesus accepts him. Remember our three questions? Am I approachable or unapproachable? Jesus, approachable. Am I inclusive or exclusive? Jesus, inclusive. Am I gracious or judgmental? Jesus, gracious. See, Jesus didn't have a problem with the six-foot rule that society had. Jesus had a problem with the 18 inches between the head and the heart of the people who are unapproachable, exclusive, and judgmental. He had a problem with that. Now watch what the guy did. The leper is coming up to Jesus, and he decides, I'm going to make a huge statement before I ever open my mouth. I'm going to say something with my actions that's large. So when the guy walks up to Jesus, remember what the Bible says? He walked up to Jesus and he bowed down and worshiped. If your Bible says worship, that's exactly what it means. It's a Greek word called proskuneo, to bow, kneel, or crouch down. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus is standing there. The crowd's upset. This guy shouldn't be there. Hey, six-foot rule, man. You're not allowed to be in a social or religious activity. Jesus just stand there. The guy comes up, doesn't say a word, and he just bows. Humility before speaking how many times have I done the absolute opposite of that then watch his first word after humility Lord his first actions humility his first word is respect now watch what he says if you're willing that's an interesting thing to say Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, Jesus, if you have the power, could you help me with that? 
He didn't say, hey, is there a supernatural thing you might be able to pull out of that bag of tricks I've kind of heard about? Could you do one of those miracles? Right? He didn't do that. He said, if you're willing. You know what that means? He's putting Jesus on the spot and asking Jesus about his own heart. From a humble position, he says, Jesus, if there's a place somewhere in your heart that would want to help someone like me, would you please help me? Now, Jesus' response, amazing. He's like, you know what? I saw what you just did, and I'm going to match you. You did something huge before you said a word, so I'm going to match you. I'm going to do something huge with an action before I say a word. It says, Jesus reached out and touched him. Can't do that. Can't do that. Jesus, you can't touch someone with leprosy. He's unclean. If you touch someone or something that's unclean, now guess what? You're unclean. So Jesus is unclean, guys. Jesus can't come to church. Mike can't come. Jesus can't come to worship service. Jesus can't come to the birthday party. Jesus can't come to cookout. He's unclean. He's going to have to go see the priest, go through some ceremonial washings, a little program, and then after the priest says he's clean, maybe we'll let Jesus back in. Jesus doesn't follow that rule. He follows a different rule. See, this just wasn't about his power. This was about Jesus' love. He didn't have to touch him to heal him. He could have healed him with a word. He could have healed him with a thought. But he said the man needs to be touched. He needs compassion. Mark chapter 1, verse 41. Remember I told you this story in two other places. In Mark chapter 1, verse 41, it says, When Jesus saw him, he was moved with compassion. The word called splankton. It's a Greek word that means movement. Compassion means love with an action. If there's no action, it's not compassion. When was the last time this leper had seen the face of someone with compassion? When was the last time this leper had been touched by someone who had compassion? I don't know. But here's what I do know. The man now is healed. I mean, try to picture the miracle. I don't know what his original hair color was. Did all the hair on his body that was white go back to original color? Did he have black hair, brown hair, blonde hair, red hair? I don't know, but he's healed, so it went back to normal color. All the sores are going to go away. Did his voice go from rough and gruff when he praised Jesus? Lord, I just want to thank you so much, and his voice is healed. Was he missing fingers and toes, and now they're back? This was special, because now this guy is 100% healed see people often initiate separation but Jesus initiates connection over my 26 years of preaching and teaching the Bible and traveling I've had the opportunity to work with the poor and the sick and the homeless here in the States but also in other places, Africa, Asia, Central America. And sometimes people will ask me, Jamie, what's the worst poverty you've ever seen? Like, where is it in all your travels? Where's the worst poverty? I said, I don't know if you can answer that. So I think poverty is bad no matter where it is. But there is one place that stood out. It's that when I was in India. See, in India, there's over one billion people. One billion people. We were in a city called Calcutta that had 14 million. So it wasn't the level of poverty, but the massive numbers that I saw. If you saw a football field filled with people in deep poverty, that would move you. Imagine a hundred football fields filled with people sick like that. You might remember there was a famous missionary, a little old lady who liked to help the poor and the sick. Her name was Mother Teresa. And she organized and established a building there called the House for the Dying and Destitute. 
And all the missionaries that would come to work there would travel throughout Calcutta and the countryside looking for those who were ill, who were dying, laying on the hard, dirty, cold streets and bringing them to this building, hoping just to give a little bit of relief, maybe some clothes, a little food, a bath, hoping that some would survive. But sadly, many do not. So I walked into that building, and to my right, I saw a number of little cots for men, and to my left, a number of little cots for women. And I wasn't really ready for what I was about to see. People just skin and bones, near death, barely moving a muscle. So I'm watching, I'm scared, I'm not really moving. And I get the Jesus tap. Remember the Jesus tap? And this is what I feel like he said to me. Jeremy, please don't just stand here and stare. Go sit down next to someone. Gently put your hand on their shoulder. And let them know that there's a Savior named Jesus who loves them. But don't just stand here and stare. Do something. Because compassion is love with an action. And it's hard sometimes. It's hard when people hurt us. It's hard when people are different than us. They look different, dress different, act different. But we need to follow the example of Jesus. Amen. We need to ask ourselves these questions. Am I approachable or unapproachable? Am I inclusive or exclusive? Push people away. Am I gracious or judgmental? So we ask, Lord, continue to teach us that love reaches out. Well, let's pray. When we look at this scripture, Lord, you see these three main characters. There's Jesus and the leper and the crowd. And for those of you that are here, man, if you right now are in a good place spiritually and you are compassionate, you are like Jesus, you look for people and you say hello and you are friendly and you reach out, people that dress different, look different, act different, that might even be ostracized in society, please keep doing that. If you have that graciousness about you and Please keep doing that like Jesus. Maybe some of you here feel like the leper. Maybe you're in a situation at work or at home or somewhere in your relationships where you do feel left out. Nobody looking around with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you feel a little left out this morning, would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand if you feel left out sometimes. Yeah, you can put your hands down. I want you to know, you're not left out with Jesus. He loves you. The psalmist says he has a bottle for every tear you ever cry and a book that he writes about you in like a little diary. This guy loves you. And I pray as a church we would learn to help love you. But maybe some of us are like the crowd. We discard people. We initiate separation sometimes. We push people away. And we avoid. Can't build the kingdom doing that. We want to bring people to Jesus. So if you struggle, no one looking around. You say, yeah, I've got a few relationships in my life that I, I initiate separation and not in a good way. Would you just raise your hand and say, yeah, I've got some people I struggle with. Just raise your hand and say, yeah. Yeah, me too. So Lord, forgive us. Help us to be approachable, to be inclusive, and to be gracious. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.